Everybody's doing well? You came to church right in the deep afternoon. Why are you here, you know? Anybody come to encounter the Lord? Anybody come to worship the Lord? To get refreshed? Amen. What is it like to feel the presence of God? It's good? Okay, that's a good answer. What else? Rum, 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 rum? <laughs> Somebody's here from Gibberishville. What was that? <laughs> that, that accent. What, what was that? How does it feel to experience the presence of the Lord? Yeah, okay, it's refreshing. That's good. What, does anyone ever get a certain sensation from the Lord? Warm inside. Okay, that's good. That's good. So if you're cold outside, you can start to worship and you'll get warm inside. That, that's good. In the throat? Okay, that's good. Uh, when I'm under strong anointing, the, the sound system kind of flares up. <laughs> Surprise, it's not doing it all the time. What else? How else do you feel the presence of the Lord? Anybody else? A heaviness, okay. But a good, good heaviness, a weighty presence. A what? We're having a cell group here. Crying? Oh, goosebumps. Anybody else get goosebumps? Man, that's good. I like that. Anybody ever cry? Like really deep cry, like like embarrassing, groaning cry, like, hey, get someone a, a Kleenex, you know, get a Kleenex, run over there. Yeah, that's good. What else? Anybody else experience the presence of God? And Is that right? You're going to pray for all of us at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But the power of God is, or uh, the presence of God is, uh, the presence of God is the substance of God. When we feel the presence of God, you're actually feeling God Himself. He's in the room. Aren't you glad that you're part of something that you can actually feel the tangible presence of God? Isn't that good? All right. Well, I want to get into this message. I've been praying a lot today and uh, just spending some time. I was trying to, I had a, a, this big outline and I was really working on this and I knew we were going to be outside <laughs> in the band shell. And so I was thinking, you know, like evangelism or something, and, but I felt like the Lord wasn't saying that. And, you know, it's funny how He knows the future. And it's like my message wasn't fitting what I was feeling. And uh, so I was praying, and the Lord said to me, uh, Shar left early and, uh, to come here, and, and I, I heard the Lord say, just spend some time with me. And I said, okay. So I got out my guitar, my guitar. And uh, if you've ever heard me play the guitar, you would absolutely know what aspirins are for. <laughs> but the Lord seems to like it. So I just spent some time with the Lord, and then He began to just really shift an atmosphere. And uh, sometimes we need to just press through in prayer and worship and, and tap into His presence. You ever been there? Um, you know that there are demonic atmospheres. There is, you know, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual hosts of wickedness in, in the spirit realm. And sometimes we need to tap into God and press through those things, rebuke things, whatever. But through worship, we can actually press through that and regain that sense of that vitality or that, that presence, that peace of God again. You ever been there? Yeah, it was good. So I was spending time with the Lord, and all of a sudden things began to open up. So I just want to take you down a little path that won't be too long. And if, if we have time at the end, I would like to, to pray for some people because I think God wants to recommission some people in this area. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Titus 2, 
11 through 14. I think this will be fun. Titus 2, 11 through 14. How many brought a Bible? How many brought an electronic Bible? I just love the fact that my iPad has about 12,000 pounds worth of books inside of it. I can't tell you how many books are on this. I just love it. What a gift from the Lord. I have about, I don't know how many different translations. I usually like one, but uh, it's good to buy. All right. Titus 2, 11 through 14. This is the New Living Translation. Again, I like a lot of different translations. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. So when Jesus died on the cross, who was that for? Is it, was it just for the rich, for the poor, for the Jews, for the Gentiles? It's for everyone, right? Anyone that goes to Him can obtain salvation, right? For the grace of God has been revealed. It's open. It's no secret. Some religions, you have to be in secret meetings to get the secret information, to read the secret books, to have the secret handshake, to hold the secret medallion. And here it says, the grace of God has been revealed. It's open. I love that. Bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Say devotion to God. God. That's right. While we look forward with hope, say hope, hope, to that wonderful day that the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. In other words, He's coming back. Amen? How many know that Jesus Christ is coming back? And you won't have to say, I wonder if that's Him. I wonder if that's Him. No, it's, it says that we'll all know. Amen? There's a lot of people that have written books on the return of Christ. It was one back in 1988. It was 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming Back in 88. He sold a lot of books. And then he... in. Uh, In 1989, he changed it, and he said, 89 reasons why Christ is coming back in 1989, and people bought his books again. He apologized, but he sure loved that big yacht. No man knows the time, no man knows the season, amen? No one knows when he's coming back. Isn't that what it says? All right. Okay. Let's get back in here. 14. He gave His life to free us, say free us, us. from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us His very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. But He did this. He did this. He went to the cross. He died for you. And is saying here, now he He takes the work out of it. I've prayed with, I don't know how many through the years, uh, drug addicts, and and I wish that every time I prayed for one that they were instantly delivered. I don't have that kind of faith, but many have been delivered. When they have tried and tried and tried and tried to change their life, uh, to be freed from this addiction, and they couldn't get free until they accepted Christ And the presence of God came upon them and began to transform their life completely. Jesus Christ is the answer to every social problem today. Jesus Christ is the answer to every social problem today. Jesus Christ is the answer to every social problem today. Amen. People come and they say, well, what do you think about this lifestyle? What do you think of that? Do you think God can really change? 
Jesus Christ is the answer to every social problem. Say amen. amen. It says here that He comes in and He sets you free from those patterns. So how do you get free from something you want to be free of? You get very close to Jesus. Let Him begin to transform you from the inside out and watch what happens. Sometimes it's instantaneous. I've seen that time and time again. And other people, it's a process, but Jesus puts His arm around you and walks you out of the dungeon step by step. And either is effective. Just say amen. Amen. I love to see people get set free. I was at a youth camp years ago, and uh, now no one can probably relate to this story. This has to do with a a man and his stepdaughter, and and, uh, he was going through just trial after trial, and and, uh, there was no peace at home, and it was no fun, and and, uh, has anyone ever experienced family issues? (laughs) Never? Okay. No, no, I'll change my story then. This girl, she was about 17 or 18, I think she was a senior, going into become a senior in high school, and we were at camp, and camp was wonderful. Uh, if you've never gone to our youth camp, you need to go. Be a counselor, God will fillet you, you'll be a fillet of fish sandwich, it'll be wrapped, served well. Um, it is good. So we're down there, and God is like changing these hardcore teens. Uh, they come in with all kinds of things. They're wrestling with bitterness. They hate life. They don't have whatever. And within a process of days, they rededicate their life or they come to Christ for the first time. And God begins to melt them and change them. And by the time they leave youth camp, they are a different person. Amen? How many have ever experienced that? Amen. I, I sure have. Man, I, I, every year I went when I was a kid, I, I, uh, it just did something to me. And so all week it had been wonderful, and there we were, the last night of youth camp, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people are all over the front, and, and uh, it's getting really late, about 11 o'clock, no one will hardly leave, people are crying before the presence of God, and some are shaking, and it's just broken, and people praying for each other, and the same ones that came in so hard, they, now they don't want to leave church. You know Why? Because they know they have to go home, and they, they want this to last forever. And they're, they're pressing in, and, and finally, us, the team, the staff that was leading it, we got together and we said, let's just let God do His thing. And we just kind of sat in the back, and we watched God do this wonderful thing. And as I'm sitting back there, this counselor, this man comes up to me, and he, he's kind of broken, and he says, I don't know what to do, but the Lord said... If, if I came and spoke to you, that, that God would use you to do something in my family. And I'm just sitting there in the presence of God, and I'm like, what? I said, well, okay. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, my stepdaughter's here. And he said, things haven't been well. And I said, okay. And I said, don't tell me anything, okay? Just let's let God do His thing. I don't like that when people, it's like they're trying to help the Holy Spirit, you know. But it's much more powerful and effective when when you receive the download and you can minister from the heart of God, you know. So uh, I said, go get her, and then she came, and she was kind of not happy about coming to see me. All these kids up there crying, and she was kind of sitting off to the side, kind of disgruntled and not happy. She could feel the presence of God, but she wasn't letting the presence of God inside of her. You ever been there? This man was a good man. He was a strong Christian. He had become a leader in his local church, and he had prayed, and he had fasted, and he had sought God for peace in his home. Uh, When he got married to this Christian woman, they married, they merged families. He had a couple kids, she had a couple kids. And one during this process, the the one daughter, the oldest daughter, uh, she was the oldest at the time of her mother's divorce. So she was probably about 12 years old. 
And it, it just, it did more to her than what people knew. You know what I mean? And she carried this through life. And then when they began to, uh, the, the stepdad and the mom, when they began to date, she really became a recluse. She, she got angry. She got hard. And uh, they came together. They got married. And then it was a disaster. Uh, they got along great. But the relationship with the stepdaughter had always been a nightmare. So they came to camp. He asked her to go, and a lot of her friends were going, so she agreed. And uh, now I don't know anything. I just know that he came up to me. And uh, see, Jesus knows what to do in every situation. If we bring him in, he'll know what to do. We think we have to, I, I love psychology, I've studied tons of psychology, I've read lots and lots of books, I've taken courses, whatever. Uh, psychology is good, but what psychology can attempt to do, Christ can do in a matter of moments. That's why we need the power of the gospel front and center in all of our lives again. If you boldly proclaim Christ, the Holy Spirit will fall upon that. Sometimes we get all, you know, uh, you know we, we don't want to offend or we, we don't want to really say that our God is really, that He really has what it takes to change a life. So we water it down until there's nothing but water. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ, and you know this, He changed my life and He changed your life. And He's going to change the person next to you. If we let him in. So he goes and gets her. She comes down. And uh, uh, we're sitting in the back. The people are all under the, you know, the, around the altar crying and praying. A sweet presence of God there. So I just simply said, Lord, I don't know anything about these people. I don't know anything about anything here. And I just asked God in your love. I said, Lord, I said, I don't know what to do with them. But I can tell there's a struggle here. And I, I said, let's join hands. So we kind of got in a circle and we're sitting there. And, and uh, I said, let's join hands. And I said, well, all we're going to do is we're going to wait on the Lord. What deep counsel, huh? <laughs> Whew. Well, Freud said. And we're waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord. Sometimes we rush things, and we're waiting on the Lord. And she was patient. She's sitting there and waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. And she begins to cry. And the weighty presence of God begins to fall upon her. And I'm just holding hands, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden, the release of the Spirit comes. And I said, ma'am, I said, young girl, I said, I... Uh, I don't remember what her name was. I said, hey, I said, the divorce was too much for you. And you cried yourself to sleep many nights. And you hoped that God would restore the marriage. But when it seemed to not work and then your mom began to date this man, it was like your hope was over. And you went through this valley and you know that this is a good man. He's prayed for you. He's fasted for you. He's poured out the love of Jesus all over you. And on the inside of you, you kept saying, I don't want his love. I don't want his love. I'm putting up a wall. I refuse to have his love. And now she's like snotty crying. Because God is revealing the deep things of her heart. And the long and the short of it was, the, uh, the Lord said, now put their hands together and watch me work. So I backed off, I put their hands together, and I said, now the presence of God is going to come and finish this. And they're standing there holding, and she starts saying, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? I didn't coach anything. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? And all of a sudden, he just bear hugs her, and they're both bawling and they're crying. And God completely restored their marriage. What counselors couldn't do, what, what others, I mean, thank God for good counselors. But what counselors couldn't do, Jesus Christ could do, because He is the counselor. Amen? Amen? You can't tell me that there is a pit too deep that Christ can't enter into and pull you out of. Amen? Amen? 
I seen that, pat, that dad, I seen that dad a few years later, and he said, things are still great. He said, I can't thank you enough. I said, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> I didn't. I held their hands. I spoke what the Lord said. It was Jesus Christ that restored that family. Just say amen. amen. All right. So Mark 4, 26 through 29, it says this. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Say scattered. scattered. Night and day, wherever he sleeps, he gets up. The, the seed sprouts and grows, uh, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, then the stock, then the head, and the full kernel in the head. And soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. When you love our community and you're kind to people and you're speaking into their life, you're being a Christian example, you're sowing seed wherever you go. Amen? How does the kingdom of God spread across Barron County and up across Chippewa and Eau Claire and out you know, a hundred miles in all directions. How does that happen? How does the kingdom overtake an area? It's through you and I loving on people, showing acts of kindness, listening to the Spirit of God, and it's a seed. You're saying, well, I've witnessed a lot of people. I didn't see too many saved. Oh, they're probably saved today. You didn't see the process you went to bed, and the, the Bible says, and the Lord went to work. You went to bed, and the Lord went to work. You went to bed, and the Lord went to work. You went to bed, and the Lord went to work. When we see that side, and when we see through the eyes of God, on the casting of seed, we would do it all the time. Terry Sellers, Pastor Terry, we've had him speak here. Um, I think he's, he's 80-something now, maybe 90, 92 I think he is. Uh, he's tried to spread the gospel to every single person in his community and that whole area. He gives out tracts. He loves on people. And he thought, you know, I think I've hit every single person alive in my area. And he was outside of a restaurant and he's standing there waiting for the car to come and pick him up. And a guy walks up to him, and he goes, hey, sir. And this guy looks at him, he goes, yeah. He goes, I have something for you. He takes his wallet out, takes this little track thing out. He said, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. If he could change my life, he can change yours. And the guy looks at him, smiles, reaches into his coat, undoes the zipper, pulls out the same track, and says, you got me about a month ago. Proverbs 14.23 says, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And when it comes to the gospel and spreading the gospel through the region, talk is great, but action is better. I was talking to a guy in, in Eau Claire one time, and the Lord said, ask him if he has any money. And I said, I'm not asking this guy. He looked nice. He dressed nicer than me, which isn't hard. <laughs> but he looked nice. He's a business guy. He's got a nice truck. He's got everything. And the Lord says to me, he says, go, you know, I was talking to him about some stuff. And he said, you ask him if, he's, if he has any money. And I said, I'm not going to ask him that. The Lord said, I said, I said, all right, you win. So I let him finish up talking, and then I went to turn, and I thought, no, I'm going to ask him. And I said, I don't know where you're at, but I really feel in my heart the Lord said to ask you if you have any money. And he looked at me. His guy's got real big, see, because we all try to put on our best. And he said, I, um, he said, I gave my kid the last $20 bill I had today, he said, we have nothing, we have no groceries. He goes, why do you ask? 
And then the Lord said, you know that $100 bill you have hidden in your wallet? I said, you can see that, Lord? He said, give it to him. So I didn't. No, I did, but it opened his heart, see? It opened his heart. It softened his heart. When we do acts of kindness as the Lord leads us, it opens people's hearts. Just say amen. Amen. We have faith inside of us. 2 Timothy 1.5, I love this scripture. I'm going to read it in two different translations, the New King James Version. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, I'd like you to put your hand on your chest and say, I have genuine faith. I have genuine faith. See, we have genuine faith. If I believe in Christ and the Spirit of God abides in me, when I came to Christ, He took some of His faith and He put it inside of me. He spoke and created the world. Amen? Amen. The Bible says He discipled His followers. He discipled the apostles. He discipled them. And one of the things that He had to awaken in them was this assurance that they could do the things that he was doing. He said, how long am I going to have to be with you? He was trying to awaken their faith. Did you know that your faith can go to sleep? Your faith can go to sleep, and your faith can wake up. I remember one time I was on an airplane, and and we were going through, uh, uh, we were just flying along, and it was about 2 in the morning, And everybody on the plane was sleeping. You ever been on one of those overseas flights? Drug-induced sleep coma? And all of a sudden, we went through some violent, um, what do you call that when everything? Yeah, that, turbulence. And I mean, boom, 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 boom. And then it dropped like 100 feet and then caught. People are doing this everywhere. (laughs) There wasn't a single person sleeping on that flight. Sometimes God has to shake us up to wake us up, amen? When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is also in you. Now, here's in the, this is the amplified. I am calling up memories of your sincere and unqualified faith. The learning of your entire personality, the leaning of, I'm sorry, the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ in absolute trust and confidence. See, Paul seen that in Timothy. He seen a faith that wasn't sleeping, a faith that was awake. A vibrant faith that trusted God. For Timothy, he he wanted to trust God to reach his community. Amen? What a fun thing to let God use you every day. I tell a lot of stories, but you collect stories when you step out in faith. That's my treasure, is God encounters. Amen? Amen? Absolute trust and confidence in power, wisdom, and goodness, a faith that first lived permanently in, your, in the heart of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am fully persuaded also dwells in you. Does it dwell in you? Do you have faith? Speaking of airplanes... I haven't shared this for a while. This is a fun story. You guys okay? See, I love that casting of seed and then going to sleep. We're casting seed everywhere. Well, we were down in Argentina with a team, and we seen lots of miracles. We got to minister, and uh, then we did cell groups and lots of fun things. God showed up. You know, God will show up if you give Him room. We overcomplicate it. So we had pictures of miracles and all kinds of little videos and things. We're on the plane and we're flying back. We start sharing these things with the people around us. Well, pretty soon, this is an international flight, people are getting up and they were kind of huddling around us 
about 15 or more people, and we were showing pictures and passing the phones around, and people were seeing pictures of dental miracles and, and all kinds of crazy miracles. And as I'm sharing this, uh, as, as the team is sharing, not just me, a lot of them were just sharing different testimonies. Uh, we got done with the flight, and we, we landed in Dallas, and we get off the flight, and it was the weirdest thing. You ever have a spiritual encounter? So uh, we're sharing the gospel, and we're sharing miracles, how great Jesus is. I get off the plane. When I left the, the walkway, the jetway, I walked into the airport in Dallas, and instantly I came under the, a very dark cloud. And I was like, whoa, what in the world? And I'm walking around, I'm like, is God even real? You ever been there? And it was like this, this clouding of ugly things. And finally, I was like, what in the world? And I stood right there in the, in the hallway, and I started to rebuke that spirit. And all of a sudden, it lifted off of me. And I said, Lord, what was that? It's, he said, that was a spirit trying to steal what, you, what you're bringing back. I said, wow, that's different. So I said, God, I said, thank you for setting me free of that, and I, I don't want that. I want to I be excited for you. I want to I share Christ. And uh, then I walked over towards the, the monitors that show the coming flights because I wanted to find out when my flight was going to be or if it was delayed. So there I am in Dallas, walk up, I look at the monitor, and uh, as I get done looking at the monitor, I turn around, now, I had rebuked that thing, I would prayed, I walked over to the monitor, and I was just kind of thanking the Lord, and I turned around, and there's a stewardess and her friend standing next to me. That's the end of the story. There's a stewardess and her friend standing next to me, and I said, oh, and, and she looked at me, and she looked like she was crying a little bit, and she said... I was in the back, we were sitting towards the back by the bathrooms, the, you know, the bathrooms. Never buy those seats. You smell chemical. So I'm sitting, and she said, I was in the back, I was listening to the stories. And she said, do you think that God can help me? And when I looked at her, all of a sudden I realized I could sense her struggle and I said, I think God can help you. I said, you have this battle going on in your mind. You feel like you're losing your mind. And you, it takes a lot of time and effort, a lot of struggle for you to maintain your sanity while you're working. You don't want anybody to know the battle that you're going through. And she looked at me. She said, I feel like I'm losing my mind. See, she never told me a thing. But Jesus Christ knew her heart. And I said, you need to give your life to Jesus, and then I'm going to pray for her, or for you. And I said, you're going you're to get instantly delivered, and God's going to change your life. People walking all over the place, they're hitting my feet with their bags. And, uh, but all of a sudden, it was like nobody else existed in the airport, but just me and these two girls. The girl said, I'll do anything. She goes, I need help. So I walked her, I took her by the hand, it her and her friend. And I walked her through the sinner's prayer, and both of them accepted Christ. See, we finished in the airplane. I went to bed, basically. You know, I left that scene, like I was saying earlier. We cast seed. See, God went to work. Isn't that good? She comes and gets me. I lead her to Christ. I looked at her. I put my hand on her head, and I took authority over a troubling spirit. And all of a sudden, she began to shake, and her nose began to run, and she began to cry, and uh, she began to hyperventilate, and all of a sudden, it was gone, right there in the Dallas airport. We've seen a lot of miracles in the Dallas airport. <laughs> you get bored when you're sitting there. Eight-hour layovers. I've seen a girl, a lady one time, healed with, anyways... Her hand, the Lord said to pray for her hand. But that, that stewardess came to Christ. And then I commissioned her. I said, now, I said, it's vitally important that you get in a Bible-believing church and get under some good discipleship. Get in a small group. And she agreed she would. 
I didn't, I didn't take her number, but I wish I could have followed up. Um, people need follow-up, amen? If she was a guy, I would have done that. You guys okay? All right. So just a couple things. If the Lord speaks to you about winning someone to Christ, and we'll wrap up here. If the Lord speaks to you about winning someone to Christ, there's an opportunity. Or let's say you come upon an accident and someone needs Jesus. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Someone's dying. They're going to they're going to meet their maker any moment. God gives you that opportunity. What are you going to do? You can't call me. I mean, you can. But God wants to use you. A couple things. Number one, ask the Holy Spirit for help. It's the first thing I do. I ask the Holy Spirit for help. Number one, I ask the Holy Spirit for help. I don't know what to do, so I ask Him because He always knows what to do. Number two is use the Scripture. Memorize a couple simple Scriptures. When you use Scripture, when you witness to someone, when you share with someone, I like to use Scripture because a Scripture carries tremendous authority. I can say my opinion is, my thoughts are, I think, but when I say the Bible says, it rips to the heart of the person. Jack Deere, a very famous theologian, author, scholar, evangelist, Jack Deere came to Christ after a terrible home life. His mom was an alcoholic. His dad committed suicide. He was, a, uh, he, he was in the military, and it did hard things to him. It was terrible. And when he was a teenager, he hated life. His dad told him the only way to heaven is to be good enough. And he thought, I'll never be good enough. He hated life. His friend got saved, and he came and he told him how he got saved, and it didn't matter at all. It bounced off him like water off a duck's back. And then he said a scripture to him about how Jesus Christ died for him, and when he said that scripture, all the other things disappeared, but the scripture went into the heart, took root, and he, at that moment he said, I need Jesus now. And his young friend grabbed him by the hand and walked him into the kingdom of God. Number two is we need to use the Scripture. It carries authority. Say authority. authority. Number three, salvation is not found in information, but through believing in Jesus Christ. You can never educate people enough to get saved. Salvation is a supernatural act from a supernatural God. Salvation comes when a heart believes upon Jesus Christ for salvation. That's when you're saved. It's not when I can take a test, not when I've gone through the classes. Salvation is when my heart believes that Jesus is my Savior, period. Amen? John 5, 38. You guys okay? You got reservations at Casa or anything? We should have everyone here go to Casa after this. <laughs> They'd be like, what in the world? People sitting out in the parking lot. All right. Salvation is not found in information, but it's, it's an encounter with Jesus Christ. Say amen. amen. And number four is use Bible stories to relate to people. We, we're taught these Bible stories, but they're great to share with someone that's struggling. Well, there was someone like you in the Bible. Let me share that story with you. There was a man full of bitterness, just like you in the Bible. This is what he did. This is what Jesus said. See, learn the Bible stories. They relate to people. You guys okay? All right. We need to wrap up.
Life with God is meant to be enjoyed, not endured. Sometimes we preach the wrong gospel message, the misery of the gospel. It doesn't say that. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. All through this COVID thing, I've said it before, you know, it, it worries me when people get sick and all that, but not one time have I felt fear through this thing. Because we have a living God inside of us, and I know my calling is not done yet. Amen? Amen. Nothing can take me off this earth until God is done with me. Amen. The Bible says, I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord, life of, with God is meant to be enjoyed, not endured. Even though there's endurance, there's those struggles, but it's far better with Christ. All right. Last thing is to, to win friends. Learn to tell your story. Pray for the opportunity for God to use you. Learn the basics of Scripture and salvation. I hit that. Number four, focus on God's love and how God changes us from the inside. Focus on the love of God, not on the, not on the, the harsh side of religion. Amen? The love of God, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. 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 I came to Christ as a tough young guy at that time. I was in hockey and wrestling and, uh, you know, our family was always off at the racetrack and things and just, just a tough kid. I've said this before, but the youth leader at that time said, I had faith for everyone to get saved in the youth group except for Bob Pittman. I don't know, I thought I was nice, but I was hard, I was hard back then. But I had an encounter with the love of God that hovered over me, I stayed overnight at my cousin's house, and uh, I knew people were praying for me, I could feel it for weeks, and I finally went to bed at my cousin's house, and I laid on the floor in a sleeping bag, and uh, we went to bed about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and he fell asleep right away, and then all of a sudden the presence of God came in the room, and all I can explain it, all I can... The only way I can describe it is that I felt something hovering over me all night, and it was the goodness of God. It was the love of God. And all night, I, just, I negotiated with God all night. God, I, I'll serve you if I can still. God, I'll serve you if I can still. God, I'll serve you if I can still. God, I'll serve you. And my arguments began to shrink. And as the love of God began to melt me, finally I said, God, there's... I said, I give up all that. I said, the only thing is, if I serve you, then I want to experience the things that the people in the Bible experienced. I said, that's the only thing I want, and I'll serve you with all my heart. And at that time, when I yielded to the Lord, it was like that hovering presence uh, was no longer hovering, but it was like it went inside of me. It transformed me. There are a number of reasons why God poured out the Holy Spirit. He wants us to encounter the pleasure of the Holy Spirit, the euphoric feeling of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great that God cares about that? And He does. He wants us to feel that elation, that, that sense of awe. But that's not the extent of it. He poured out the Holy Spirit primarily to give us boldness to share the gospel wherever we go. Amen. And if we focus our affection and ask God for a refilling to empower us, to encounter the love, to encounter the joy, to encounter the euphoric feeling of the Spirit. But if we pursue God and say, I want more of your Spirit so I can be a master seed sower, He'll visit you on a whole nother level. God is aching with great desperation to send out laborers again to cast seed. Amen? He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts, grows, though he does not know how. 
All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as, as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. How many want to be an agent of God? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. It's 546. That means we usually get done within two hours. Can we give the Holy Spirit room? If you need to leave, that's, that's fine. If you're done before me, you can go. If you're done before God, you can go. That's mean. No, if you need to go, that's okay. I'm just teasing. But I, I want to give God just a little more time. And when I went to come up here, the Lord said, I want to commission people for the harvest. Can we do that? How many feel like you want to you wanna make a difference? Amen. I, I heard the Lord say, I want to commission people for the harvest. So I'd like the ministry team to come up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this fairly quickly, but yet reverently. I'd like someone to tickle the ivories. If someone can do that. <laughs> ministry team, if you guys would come up. I need about four or five people, so if you'd come up, maybe some cell leaders. And let's make two rows. Let's make two rows. If you guys just get together here. All right. And Pastor Jake and Abby, if you guys would come and just stand on the other side of them. Dan, if you'd come up. Just make a tunnel. Pastor Jake, I'd like you to take this and give each of the people that are praying. Pastor Shar, if you want to come up and help, that'd be great. I felt the Lord, not felt, He spoke to me and He said, I want to commission people for the harvest. So God wants to give you a fresh anointing tonight. God wants to give you a fresh anointing. He wants to refill you, but He wants to anoint you with a fresh anointing to reach your friends and your neighbors for Christ. How many are ready to be used of God? You ever been on a baseball team and you sat on the bench the whole time? In the kingdom of God, that's a choice, but God wants you to be in the field playing. Amen? If you're benched in the, king, in the kingdom of God, it's because you've benched yourself. So God wants to give you a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit, to recommission you, to, to, to feel the euphoria of the Spirit, to feel that, that great sense, that's good, to refresh you in that, that's good, but to allow you to encounter the Holy Spirit to give you boldness to witness, to give you a sensitivity to the Spirit to love people to Jesus. Amen? How many would like that? All right. I'm going to start with this section over here, and I just all I want you to do is I just want you to come from the front, whoever wants to, and then just walk through, and they're going to pray for you, and just trust the Lord in this process, and then just go and then find your seat, amen? So let's just do that. Go ahead, and then we'll go this section, then this section, then this section, amen. Holy Spirit, we just pray that you'd come. I pray for a fresh anointing. I pray for a fresh encounter of the Spirit of God tonight. Holy Spirit, God is here. I feel His presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just go ahead and bring Him through. God will do His work if we do His. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just break off any hindering thing, anything that has been holding people back. We just pray for the fresh touch of the Lord tonight, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Whew. Jesus' name. Hey, Terry, come here. Just stand right here. Pray for people as they're coming. God wants to use you today.
Just stay on there. Let God use you. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. Keep them moving. Keep them moving. Keep them moving. God will show up as they're moving. God will show up as they're moving. God will show up as they're moving. You watch. See, he's already moving. Just keep them moving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Lord. Just keep them moving. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Fresh anointing. That's right. Woo. <laughs>